people don't realise if you're not living mm. in social housing just how bad things are. From when they hung the phone up on me, I said to myself, now I have a point to prove. What are some of the worst conditions oh, that God. you've seen? I could be here for an hour. Their houses have been flooded with boiling hot water. One lady sustained life-changing burns as a result of that. Her daughter's rubber welly were melted. It was that hot. Cockroaches, damp, mould, ceilings collapsing on top of people. I've had cupboards collapsing and knocking one lady unconscious. They're not giving enough, yet they're going to come out and beg for our votes, and it's a shame. It really is a sad state of affairs. I don't care who it is. I don't care what your views are. I'll call out absolutely whoever it is that I don't think is doing their job. In the beginning, I did think that we were the only sort of case who didn't really know because no one really talks about it, especially in social housing, or mm. talked about it because of the stigma and the shame that came along of with course, it. Of course, yeah. And even for us, we didn't want to talk about it. And it wasn't until I had just had enough, once social media shared it, that I started learning that other people had been living in those sorts of conditions um, via social media, but then also knocking on every single door of my estate and going into um, tenants and neighbours' homes and seeing they're living in much worse conditions. I mean, one lady, 27 years, she had been complaining for um, about rodents and mice, and she had she's in her 60s, and had to go and buy cement from B&Q, mix it in her living room, and try to fill the holes herself, and it didn't fix the issue, but that's how desperate people were and are, and people don't realise, if you're not living mm. in social housing, just how bad things are because one tenants are ashamed and are normally blamed for it yeah. when it's not their fault because they're paying for a service they're not receiving and that is paying their landlord rent and they're not yeah. receiving the service to fix issues within their home and um to the stigma that comes along with just being a social housing tenant yeah of course and what made you take to social media at this point i was annoyed i was very very frustrated i mean my dad had passed away in 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 those sorts of conditions and we had complained to the housing provider and the housing provider had known that my dad was ill living in those conditions and known about the whole situation when they were approached by um well this was after by the the news but the reason i initially went to my well my social media and shared it on social media is because we was just being ignored i'd been complaining about mumps my ceiling had been missing there was lights filled with water there was uh, damp there was mold the kitchen was old there was mice running around the homes cockroaches and they just wouldn't come out and wouldn't listen i got to a point where i'd been phoning i was at work i'd been stressing myself out i had been sp spending more time on the phone at work trying to get through to them on a daily basis than I was actually doing work and it started to get to the point where I just thought they're not going to listen and mm. they hung the phone up on me one day when I phoned them up to, to complain and they said we're really busy we're not coming out today and put the phone down on me and that's when I realized the penny really dropped and I thought to myself they're not coming out I've had enough of them yeah I, I thought the ball has been in their court for too long and I said, I'm going to, so I'm just going to turn yeah. to social media and what's the worst that can happen? People slag me off for the conditions that I live in when it's clearly not my fault. And I did, I shared it. And I mean, I was overwhelmed by the amount of messages of people firstly saying that they were too living in similar conditions, but completely outraged that people were paying rent and being forced yeah. to live in these conditions. And in my case, by the biggest housing association in Europe. Mm. So I'm, they, they knew I wasn't a lone case. This must have been happening across the country. And then I went on later to prove it absolutely was. Yeah, which is, I mean, I think there's this huge misconception. I mean, there are many misconceptions mm. around social housing, but I also think that, you know, one of the biggest ones is people, when you see people commenting on a line saying whatever, mm. what people don't understand as well is like, you are paying rent mm. to be in the, like in Absolutely. this situation. It's subsidized housing, it's social housing. We should have access to like the welfare. Mm. Um, and you're paying rent to be in a situation. Mm. Imagine if you were, you know, it, it, people mm. who are not in social housing, imagine mm. if you had a landlord and were there and your ceiling was missing and there were vermin and all of these things. And because it's the state, you literally cannot get through to them. Yeah. Like it's a very different scale mm. and they really can and have ignored so many people for mm. you to be able to get to that point. Mm. And when, when you then did share that on Twitter, what happened? I mean, it went viral pretty mm. much instantly. I mean, 
within an hour, it probably retweeted over a thousand times comments in the section. And this Same. was about, I think I shared it at like 10 a.m. Yeah. People at work and it just spiraled and spiraled and spiraled. And um, then I started having journalists reach out and journalists picked it up and whatnot. And a local journalist picked up or a London based journalist picked up my um, my individual story, first of all. So that was shared um, in the, the news. But then the housing provider, even after learning about my dad's story, this living situation, the fact that we've been living in those conditions for absolutely years, turned around and I will never forget the quote they used. And that was, we're sorry that Quajo feels as though he hasn't received the service he deserved. That was after my dad passing away in those conditions. That was after not having a ceiling over winter. That was after cockroaches and mice. That was after all of that. And they turned around and said, we're sorry, Quajo feels as though he hasn't received service. That to me wasn't an apology. No, and I said, not an it, was apology. it was an absolute insult. And I said to myself that day, I said, I'm not going to ring them up again. If they want to play that game, it won't be me contacting them now. It will be national journalists. And that's absolutely what happened. That's absolutely what happened because I then went on and done the exact same around my estate and knocked on over 500. This was after work, went around with two other um, people on my estate and knocked on uh, every single door, put a letter in every single door. And by the time I'd gone from one end to the other, I was getting messages already. I was getting phone really? calls of tenants. Yeah. Um, and it was about a few hours. Yeah. And then it was for the next few weeks, it was constant. And ITV News then picked it up um, and came down and we filmed for around two weeks um, and I helped them. We organised it. Everyone on the state sort of came together and was helping yeah. organise this, get people that we're filming with, etc. cetera. And um, it went out as a top story on national news. And Amazing. from that moment, they were absolutely shamed and disgraced into responding. And since then, they've had to carry out over 700 repairs of my estate alone Amazing. and replace about 40 kitchens, 40 bathrooms. Yeah. This is, and if, if that hadn't happened, I, I mean, my estate won't be knocked down for another about five to 10 years, it could be. They would have let people live in those conditions for the next five to 10 years. 100%. And done nothing. It's just, I mean, it's infuriating. It's unbelievable. Mm. I'm sure that through that time, it was just everything you could think about, you know, mm. before you actually got that kind of answer mm. from them. And the fact that it had to happen through them being essentially shamed mm. and kind of to a point of them feeling like they couldn't ignore it because suddenly they had always been the more powerful ones. Mm. And suddenly you've got this kind of power behind you and awareness through purely stating the facts. Mm. I just think that even the fact that everyone who saw your mm. tweet or saw the ITV stuff or any of that was so appalled shows just how much they're kind of mm. very much trying to keep this under wraps. And the fact that, I mean, it, it serves them to have this stigma mm. um, and it serves them to have something where it's like, oh, we can't really talk about mm. it because if you're kept silent, you're kept silent. Mm. And thank God for you being able to actually have the strength to do that and mm. then go on and make it into something so amazing and mm. so effective mm. and how's how has your life changed since then well i mean on that first point from when um that they they hung the phone up on me i said to myself now i have a point to prove i have a yeah. point to prove and i want to make sure i do mm. and i thought they probably think i'm a 23 year old working class boy from an estate mm. why the hell do we need to listen to him and i said that's the they've underestimated me and I'm going to make sure they know, know about it. And from the day that they hung the phone up on me and I told myself they won't be hearing from me, it will be journalists. On that day, I'd say the only person that knew about me in that organisation was the, the the surveyor that was coming around and doing mm. absolutely nothing. And a matter of days later, everyone from him to the CEO of the organisation knew exactly who I was and that's exactly what I wanted. Because if I could stop... Um, another family, another sick individual being forced to live in those sorts of conditions and go through what it was that my dad did. And I, I wasn't able to help him then. Mm. And I wasn't able, if the situation had changed now, I probably could, but I couldn't then. But I was going to make sure that they as an organisation wouldn't get away with it. And I, I mean, I can say it. I, I, I'm probably the worst thing that's happened to that organisation um, since that started. And I'm, I'm glad about yeah. it. I'm glad because it's, it's shown them that they can't just mug people off and mug social housing. They're tenants, the ones that are paying their wages um, and, and just treat them any which way they like. It's not going to continue to happen. Mm. And the, I think the fact that I'm 23 made it feel even better to me because it's then shown other young people out there that 
it doesn't matter your age, it doesn't matter your background or where you're from. If something's wrong, you stand up for it. And it doesn't matter if you're standing up against the biggest CEO to, to an organization in Europe or whoever it is, you, your voice matters just as much as, because they wouldn't live in those sorts of conditions. Once I started and I saw that it was making change in my situation, I said to myself, I mean, I couldn't just pull up the ladder behind him. I, I just couldn't do that. I yeah. wouldn't feel comfortable being sat in my house after it had been repaired. Finally, after years, knowing that my neighbors were going through the exact same thing and they're still there suffering. So I decided to continue doing that. And then I went around their local estates that was run by the same housing provider, exact same conditions. And then I had people reaching out from different parts of London, different housing providers, local authorities and housing associations. And I was going and shaming them publicly too. And it built this presence because people then learned that, oh my gosh, this is the guy that's disgracing landlords mm. for poor living conditions. And they really did. If it wasn't for social media and people on social media, I wouldn't be here. Um, and they really, truly backed it. And I, I learned then that the, the biggest cost to an organisation and housing provider and local authority is bad PR mm -hmm. and being shamed. And I learned that was the key. And that's something I carried from the very, very beginning. And it's got me to this point too, because it wasn't just housing providers. It was also, it's also MPs that I've been shaming. Yeah. Um, people of high positions that are supposed to be doing the job that I'm doing for free, mm. that I'm going around doing for free, they're paid to do. And things started m moving. Um, people, people and organisations, news were reaching out to me, asking me about it. And it's sort of, I fell into the position of being called an activist and campaigner. Mm. And I just decided I'm gonna go around the country and do it. And yeah. it's picked up massively. I mean, the government caught on to it and saw what it was that I was doing. And everyone admitted that no one should be living in th these sorts of conditions. So, from, And you shouldn't have it having to do their work. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. But from that, that moment, I said, OK, we mm. all agree. We're all on the same page that no one should be doing or living in these sorts of conditions. So mm. the question is now, it's, it's no longer debating that. It's how do we change this and what are we going to do to fix it? Because mm. this is, hasn't been going on for the year I've been going around with my iPhone in tenants homes has been going on for the last 40 years and they've been very much aware of it but mm. not seen it as a priority and because they're not living in in it mm. and they're living in ivory towers in comfortable homes they don't have to see it as an issue and it's a massive culture issue and culture problem especially in this UK in, the, in this country where um I feel there's many people out there that think oh there's this social issue or there's this issue but it doesn't directly affect mm. me it's not my problem mm. it's whoever's problem is it, it's someone else's problem, not theirs. And I think that's something that I'm trying to shift and change because it shouldn't be the case. I mean, we should we should be a country where we're looking out for others. I mean, we're the sixth richest um, nation in, in the world, yet people are living in slum conditions and slum homes. And when I say that people are dying in their homes, people often think, oh, he's exaggerating. But I've seen others. My dad was an example of it. I've, I've seen other tenants where they're battling stage four cancer and they're having to fight their providers just to not live in an, an environment full of damp or mold or cockroaches. One lady, for example, lung cancer, was living in a house full of black damp and mold. It makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. Yet no one talks about these issues. Yeah, I mean, it is horrendous. Mm. Um, and what are some of the, so people can understand just how yeah. bad it is, what are some of the worst conditions oh, that God. you've seen? Some of the worst conditions that I've seen, I mean, that I could be here for an, for an hour for the rest of the, the interview. Um, cockroaches, damp, mould, um, ceilings collapsing on top of people. I've had cupboards collapsing and knocking one lady unconscious. I've been to a home where they're, We've well, been to or seen several homes where their, their their houses or communal areas have been flooded with boiling hot water. One lady um, sustained burns, life changing burns as a result of that. And it, I mean, the water was so hot. Her daughter's rubber welly, she showed me once I arrived, were melted. It was that hot. Um, I've seen new builds flooded with water. I've seen, um, gosh, the list goes on. People yeah. living with cupboards falling apart. People living in their front rooms because they've had their ceilings missing or taken down and not replaced. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. There was one guy, for example, he was a disabled tenant and had to defecate in bags for almost 10 months. I think it was 10 months to a year because they just wouldn't come out and replace his broken toilet. Those are the sorts of issues that are happening behind the scenes and they're having to reach out to me. And it's been hundreds, if not thousands of tenants I've spoken to. Um, having issues and they the sole reason they reach out to me is because they've exhausted all other avenues and complaints avenues that they're told to go down 
because they're just doing nothing about yeah. it. So they're coming to me out of desperation to try and help them with their situation. And that shouldn't be the case because if I wasn't here, a lot of them would still be suffering in silence and ignored. And this is a systemic issue clearly. Yeah. And although there's organizations and providers that may, and government officials that may not want to admit this is a national crisis, I'm telling you it yeah. absolutely is because yeah. I've been out there doing the work. And and when when people's eyes so clearly tell them that it's that much of an issue when, you know, just from seeing one circumstance, mm. AKA, you know, your the situation you were in, it's not, it's not that there's any debate about whether we think it's right. Yeah. Everyone knows it's wrong. Mm. And if you say if you're denying that, you're obviously it's obvious mm. like you know if you think about it, you know that is completely wrong. Um, it is just pure laziness. Mm. It is it it's insane. And as you say, it's a hugely systemic issue because, you know, from the first person you'd be on the phone to mm. at Clarion versus like kind of the people higher up mm. it's it needs a huge shift mm. to be able to change and mm. to be able to kind of get out of this not just by plastering over issues mm. and fixing things as they should but also changing the system in which that, that created these mm. issues mm. and how not that you should be doing this work for them but how do you think that this can change I mean, it, it, there needs to be, and which, I mean, I've spoken to the government about this um, and have been working alongside them and with them mm. for a while now. And obviously now everything in politics is on its head. So it kind yeah. of pauses now till September. Yeah. But I, I've given them, I've, I've met with the mayor of London. I have met with um, Michael Gove, housing secretary and his team, the housing team. Um, you name it. I've, I've met with um, the late Labour MPs and I've mm. told them, I've given them multiple ways um, of how they can fix this. I think the list was about 14 or 15 points of how they can, or how I see from yeah, my experience, they can, job. yeah, they can fix these issues. And the thing is, all of the suggestions I gave didn't cost a lot. It didn't cost a lot of money. That's not an excuse, um, but they will be impactful. And I think massively change the current situation for tenants and give them a voice. I mean, regulation, for example, needs mm. to change massively. There's barely any regulation in the private and um, social housing sector. I think we need to be holding providers to account for allowing people to live in those sort of slum yeah. conditions and basically violating any sort of health and safety policies that should be going, especially after Grenfell. That annoys me and frustrates me the most is that five years on, this is still happening. And we saw what happened after Grenfell. We saw the MPs, the members of parliament, the government officials, the, house, the members of housing providers put statements out and go out there whilst Grenfell had happened and saying how terrible it is, how bad it is, um, how shocked they are, how things need to change. Yet five years on, Barely anything's been done. Mm. Barely anything's been done. What's been uncovered now is people are living in the same similar conditions, but the, the same thing is happening from those fam from what happened back when Grenfell happened and what the families were complaining about afterwards. And that was that the tenants were ignored. What we're seeing mm. now is tenants are still being ignored. Well, the thing with Grenfell as well is it wasn't just afterwards. Before, yeah. they there was an entire operational group of the mm. residents within mm. the tower that had essentially raised concerns over and over and over about fire safety, about all of these kind of various different things. Mm. You know, 64% of the legally required fire doors were broken mm. or missing mm. on the night of the fire, a problem that would have cost around £30 to £130 to fix. They had brought this to the housing organization and the association to essentially say all of the, you know, all of these issues and we don't feel safe and essentially putting people to live in conditions mm. that they're essentially sitting ducks for a mm. problem that's going to happen. And what is absolutely terrifying for people who don't know is that original concerns that they'd stated and had been ignored, they'd done a write-up afterwards. And in this write-up before the tragedy, they stated that, to quote, only a catastrophic event will expose the ineptitude and incompetence of our landlord and bring an end to the dangerous living conditions and neglect of health and safety that they inflict upon their tenants and leaseholders. 
That was before Grenfell Fire. So the fact that they are having to deal every day with the thought that they are not safe, that there are not fire doors in place, I'm sure many other issues as well that you've kind of, that you've raised. Mm. The fact that they would have to be essentially living in that, there were this flammable cladding, mm. like putting something on a building to make it look nicer mm. for residents nearby that they actually mm. do care about, mm. that's essentially making a building a matchstick mm -hmm. and people having to live inside that being also organizing work to do their job and mm -hmm. bringing the problems to the association for that to have happened and for not only no arrests to have been made or no real inquiries in terms of actually being able to bring anyone mm -hmm. to not just justice but also to make improvements for the future so that this never happens again mm -hmm. the fact that this is inherent in the mm. entire social housing mm. industry mm. is just, it's unthinkable. Mm. It's literal, I mean, it's- Negligence. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's negligence. And Beyond it's also that. like so much more. It's yeah. like for uh, apparently only 72 people, it's a fucking load, yeah. but apparently only 72 people to mm. have died in the Grenfell fire and for no one to have been held to account and nothing to be improved. The mm. amount of places that still have that flammable cladding mm. is just insane. So like, I, I, it, it's completely, I mean, you don't really know what to even say about it. Like, how can we change this? How can it be changed? Mm. Because if something like that mm. isn't enough to bring people to account or to mm. bring around change, then, like what will be? I mean, it's a huge problem. And I said, I've said before, had had Grenfell been uh, an office block in Canary Wharf, mm -hmm. would we would we have waited so long for an inquiry to happen? Would it have taken so long for it to be investigated? Absolutely not. I can tell you that for free. Yeah. Um, it's a systemic problem, and uh, housing providers would often say, "Oh, we don't we don't prioritize profit. We're a charity," and they say that. But let's use Grenfell as an example, like you described. And there's seventy. So they say seventy two people. Mm -hmm lost their lives and we can see there in black and white the reasons as to why and what they did was they prioritized cost efficiency and cheap materials over the health and safety and lives of their tenants that's not just a, a single issue with grenfell that's a systemic issue within social housing is they're doing that up and down the country and we're even seeing it now that's why tenants are suffering so much and having so many problems in their home it's money being prioritized and savings being prioritized over the lives of human beings and if i i don't know if that i don't know if that's not disgusting and shows how bad things are i don't know what is mm. i mean like i could not agree more. And I also think that the important thing when presenting and talking about solutions as you do is the fact that it might be more cost effective now, mm. but it's not more cost effective when you have to have your people on the phone all the time because it's mm. broken, you know, mm. less than a year after and actually isn't sorting it out or, you know, there's a national tragedy, like people actually dying. Mm. It's, it's not actually the change needs to be in the way that people, you know, they need to understand that it's not cost effectiveness. It's cost effectiveness in the short term mm -hmm. and it's essentially PR mm -hmm. and it's essentially them, you know, trying to put a plaster over a huge crater mm -hmm. that's never going to be able to be fixed without changing the systems. And what is in what is so insane as part of this too is these materials that are being used in order to save money or to make things look nicer or whatever it might be are also materials that they would never allow to be used on that office block you mm. talk about. Mm. Like I did a renovation, for example, of mm. my own home, Build, it, building regulations had to come round and check that everything was safe mm. because I'd done a big renovation, right? Mm. The fact that they can make the time out of the day to be sending me letters all the time, and I know that it will be different associations, mm. but the fact that I can get letters and letters and letters being like, we need to come round and check this when the renovation's done, mm. Where the hell is the checking of health and safety of people that you know for sure are not in that yeah. kind of place? I mean, where's the governing body that regulates the quality and materials being used to knock up social homes? Because I'm going to new builds after seven years that are absolutely falling apart, pipes corroding, and that's why we're having boiling hot water pouring out of um, 
pouring out of their ceilings. And I mean, there's no evacuation plan for that. There's no evacuation plan if you're on the 11th floor of a tower block and all the pipes burst in your ceiling and in your home with boiling hot water for how, how you're going to escape, how you're going to get out of that. There's no evacuation plan for that. That's not even taken into consideration, but it's a reality. And I've seen it happen time and time again. And like you say, like you said, in terms of regulation of materials and whatnot, they kind of regulate themselves, mm. the developers and the providers. And what we're seeing and what we've seen is they prefer cost efficiency and saving money over anything else. And those two go hand in hand. And it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's just going to be a disaster if that's the case, because they're going to want to save money. And ultimately, it goes back to the tenants. They're going to have to pay the price, whether it's with their health and safety, whether it's with the rent that they're going to have to pay, whether it's with the leaseholders and what they're charged in order to fix issues and broken doors, etc. Or ultimately, with their lives, like we saw with Grenfell. It's such it's such an awful state, mm. and it, the mo one of the most frustrating things is that there is, are no clear steps to be that people are, that they're kind of taking to get out of it. Mm. Um, if there was this, you know, longer roadmap, for example, that could have come out of the Grenfell inquiry mm. to just say, these are the things that we're actually going to do. And, mm. you know, this will be banned. The fact that other buildings still have the exact same cladding is just, I mean, kind of just goes to show exactly mm. how little that it is mm. kind of being cared about. Um, do you think that it would, imp the situation would improve with different leadership? Different leadership, huh? So with my no, work, I always, <laughs> yeah, no. So with my work, I always try to keep politics out of it only mm -hmm. because I don't want it to detract, detract from the right, issue at hand course. and um, the message I'm trying to get forward in housing and the conditions of people's homes and the crisis should be front and centre. However, politics does absolutely affect, absolutely. I mean, it affects everything. Politics affects everything in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, do I think if it's between Conservative and Labour, Labour's going to perform any better from what I've seen so far? Sadly... Um, for many, um, I, there's nothing for me to grasp onto to say that they're right. going to do to, to do any better. I mean, yes, there are MPs within Labour that absolutely care and they do a great job. Like I'm going to name Karen Buck, for example, mm -hmm. who has been doing this for for years and talking about housing. But when if we're not getting any answers from or or talk, no, if your leader, for example, isn't talking about these issues or creating any plans on how we're supposed to tackle it or how we're going to make it any different and better for tenants and give them more power and more voice. What what, what are tenants voting for? Because mm. I mean, ultimately, whether you're conservative or Labour, you're going to be sending your MPs out in two years time, telling them to go and beg for votes on estates in urban areas where people have been dealing with disrepair and living in dangerous accommodation. You're going to beg them and promise them X, Y, and Z then. Why aren't you doing it now? Why mm. are you not trying to create improvements now. Give them, why are you not giving them hope? Why are you not telling them what's going to be done differently? Why are you not making housing and the housing crisis a priority? And it always comes down to one answer to me and that's because they don't live in it. They yeah. don't live in it. I mean, they get to go back to their nice homes. Their, their homes are safe. I'm sure it's been regulated whenever it was built or whatnot. If they're living in private homes, if they've built their own homes. Yeah. Kia Starmer, uh, well, I was going to say Boris Johnson, but Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak, they're going to be going back to their nice mm. homes. They don't have to worry if they've got cockroaches, uh, mice, damp, mold, if the ceiling's going to have to, going to collapse, um, above them, if they're going to have hot water pouring from, pouring from their ceilings. They don't have to worry for that, worry about that. So it's not a priority to them. And I see that, but it should be. Mm. And they should, instead of being concerned about grabbing the title of prime minister, they need to be more concerned about the job at hand and those suffering and those that need help. And what I've seen over the last few months is that from all sides, the leaders are more concerned about grabbing the title of prime minister than doing an actual decent job and actually dealing with cri a crisis like the housing crisis and people living in squalor and slum conditions. And it's a, it's a real shame. It's a real shame. I'm, I'm disappointed and I can say I, I, I'm disappointed in conservatives, like a lot of tenants have told me they're mm -hmm. disappointed in the conservatives and the fact they've done nothing over the last 12 years to tackle this. But I've had loads of tenants too tell me they're disappointed in Labour's lack of response and Labour's lack of response from the top when it comes to housing and poor conditions mm. and MPs. And I mean, it's across the country. And this housing crisis, it, it's not it's not just one party to blame for it. I mean, you look at London, London's run by majority Labour councils. Mm. And I mean, the housing crisis here is absolutely yeah. horrific. I can tell you that because I've been around London. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say up north, it's not worse with 
um, the Conservatives and Conservative constituencies, but yeah. it's across the country. It's a national crisis and every single party should be jumping on board and trying to create solutions for this. Unfortunately, they're not giving enough, yet they're going to come out and beg for our votes. And it's a shame. It really is a sad state of affairs. It really, really is. Mm. And, and what can people who are angry about it mm. do? I mean, I know it, the, the the onus should not be on people. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> it should be on regulation, but yeah. No, absolutely. Shaming um, their providers, getting onto their um, MPs and councillors. And like, I don't want to say all landlords are absolutely horrific. Um, and I don't want to say all MPs are bad at responding to housing conditions. Could they do enough? Pro probably they could. They yeah. could all do enough to to shine a light on it and spread the message of poor housing, even if it's a simple tweet. It's not hard yeah, to put yeah. a tweet out. It's not hard to email your your leaders and tell them this is a concern of constituents. Because I know, I know for a fact, because I've seen it firsthand, the amount of emails that individual MPs get about housing issues on a year-to-year -year basis. And it's absolutely disgraceful that it's been going on for years and there's been no real mention mm -hmm. about it publicly. There's more that can be done on on the sides of MPs and government officials, but in regards to tenants, um, collective action, um, going to unions, joining tenants unions, um, you can speak to places, charities like Shelter if you're having issues. Obviously I'm here, I'm just one person and I've had thousands of people come to me, but I'm gonna continue doing the work that I was doing a year and a half, a year and a half ago, and I know you asked me earlier, oh, what sort of changed in in the last year and a half? The one thing that hasn't changed is my commitment to tenants yeah, and them being the priority. I mean, like a year and a half ago, I was going around knocking on estates by myself in in the in the winter, and like people must have thought I was absolutely weird. But I mean, I'm still doing that. I'm still climbing climbing tower blocks. I'm going around the country by myself doing it. Mm. So I'm very very much still committed. Um, and tenants just need to talk about it. Whether you're suffering a disrepair or not, what we can understand is that this is wrong. We know the difference between right and wrong as human beings. A child would be able to tell you that this situation is completely wrong. Um, we need to be having those conversations. And it's not just in the social sector, but private sector too. I mean, it is honestly like the Wild West when it comes to landlords. And again, not all private landlords are terrible, but there are some out there who are, it should be absolutely criminal the way in which they charge uh, renters ridiculous prices whilst having them live with missing ceilings, damp, mould, cockroaches, mm. everything I've described in social housing. And arguably, it's much worse in um, private rented accommodation because a lot more people are privately renting in social mm. housing. It's 4 million people, around 4 million in private housing. It's a lot, lot um, more. So, yeah, holding people accountable, holding landlords accountable, holding people that public figures, public servants that are meant to represent you accountable too, because ultimately you're going to be voting for them. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And what's your, what's, what's the big goal for you? Are you in terms of, I know that you've taken this on yourself and you've done so mm. incredibly. Am I right in thinking that your original, did you originally want to be an artist? I did. Yes. Yes, I did. And how do you think now about your kind of career and what you want to do? I know that you've obviously been like very much pulled in this direction mm -hmm. and you've done such an incredible job. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when things like that happen, it's kind of like, OK, meant to be. Yeah. Um, but for mm -hmm. you personally, you're carrying a lot on your back yeah. and yeah. you're carrying a lot of responsibility because you care so much about something that, yeah. you know, really other people should be dealing with. But. Honestly, I mean, huge kudos to you for doing it. You. What is your, what what do you want from your career in this and also outside of that? Um, I mean, my perspective has completely changed. Yeah. Um, I never thought I'd be dealing, if you had asked me five years ago, would we be doing anything in house? And I'd be like, absolutely not, that's yeah. <laughs> I would, I would. Um, but it's funny how life works, I think. And I still want to be an artist. I still want to paint. I still want to be creative. That's that's just within me, that's what I do. And for the last year and a half, I haven't been able to do that. I haven't been able to pick up a paintbrush. Um, and that's the number one thing that I wanted to do. However, housing's come along and the conditions people are living in, these social issues, and they they mean a lot more. I don't think you can put a price or satisfaction on that and helping tenants get out of these sorts of situations. And I want to take it very much to the end. I want to see change in government. I, and I'll make it clear, I don't care who it is that's willing to make that change. I don't care what party you're affiliated to. Mm. I don't care what your views are. I want this crisis fixed, this housing crisis fixed. I want tenants to have more power. I want better regulation so that mm. um, future generations aren't having to suffer like 
people have and social housing tenants have for the last 40 or 50 years. So I will go to the very end and I'm not planning on going anywhere until whether it's this government or the next government or the government after takes this on and deals with it. Yeah. And I will keep applying pressure. I don't care. I've always said I will call out absolutely whoever it is that I don't think is doing their job. Mm. Um, because I think they should, whether you're in government or not, if you're not willing to do your job or do it effectively or do enough to create change, then you should yeah. get out of your position yeah. and give it to someone that will. That's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. When it's affecting people's lives and yeah. their every day and all yeah. of that, then there is, yeah there's, yeah, there's no space for that really, is there? When there's people's lives at stake and there's people's livelihoods, when there's people, you know, at this uh, one point, and I mean, even now, mm. it was you should have been able to be at university yeah. being a student. Mm -hmm. And not only were you dealing with your father passing away, mm -hmm. but also then having to deal every day as a full-time fucking job, yeah. dealing with people to be able to live in normal, what yeah. should be normal conditions. Mm -hmm. I can imagine now you're very fulfilled on the everyday because you're doing what you know what you love and yeah. what you want to be doing but i can imagine also it's probably quite exhausting yeah doing something that you care about so mm -hmm. much and that you have so much emotional investment mm -hmm. in changing mm -hmm. how do you look after yourself <laughs> i just uh, keep going to be honest and i have been warned in the past of uh, like burning out and whatnot but i know how i felt and where my mindset and where I was mentally when my just after my dad passed away and it was an absolute gutter. I mean, it couldn't yeah. have got any worse, I don't think. And it mean, I was pushed right to the edge, to the very edge. And um, I, I know emotionally and mentally right now I can handle this and what's going on. And every time I go into the tenant's house and they're suffering with disrepair, I can see the stress. It brings back those emotions and I often do leave absolutely depressed. Um, but the satisfaction I get is taking them straight out of that situation and having things change. Yeah. Um, for them, I mean, in regards to mentally, I think my housing provider and my situation robbed me of my ability to grieve for my dad after he had passed yeah. away because of the disrepair and whatnot that I was living in. But I'm I'm in a I'm in an okay place at the moment. I'm, I'm not going to lie; it's still not easy. Yeah. There's still days and times where it's hard, and you think about things. But this mentally is keeping me busy at the moment, um, which I'm which I'm glad about. I think, um, but I do at some point when I have a holiday, a break, even if it's temporarily. But I did go to Ghana to see my grandma, who's my dad's my dad's mum for the first time. But even while I was out there, I was still taking calls yeah. whilst out shopping and from mm -hmm. tenants over here, trying to help their situation, sending emails on the way up on the coach up to Leicester to go to uni to MPs and housing providers for tenants, sat in lectures doing the exact same. It was difficult and it was really, really hard. I can't lie looking back, but I'm glad I've got through that bit. But I just genuinely want change. I want someone's take on this housing housing crisis and, and treat it like the priority it should be. And then after that, I mean, I would much rather not be here having to do this. I really, really would. If, if the housing was just a complete paradise and it was just running smoothly, I'd be much happier and I would have had a whole different experience, I think. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, that's not the case and that's not how life works. Um, so I'm just going to continue until I can't no more, I think, yeah. and, until this is until this is fixed and try and take try and take time out for myself when yeah. I can and where I can. Please do. Yeah. Um, well, you're incredible. I'm so in awe of what you've done. Thank you. Um, and what you continue to do. Mm. And for people who are listening and want to be able to mm. help how, how can they help the cause? How can they, is there somewhere we can donate in terms of your work? I know that you're doing a lot of this for free. Yeah. I know that, that, you know, you're obviously not being yeah. paid for it in lots of ways. How can we support um, helping you get there and helping you as well as an activist and person? Um, well, I mean, currently I have a GoFundMe set up and loads of people, I did not expect so many people to donate. I mean, I was absolutely shocked. One person said, I want to donate to GoFundMe. You haven't got one, so I made one. And then loads of people donated, which has just allowed me to go around the country yeah. and help so many more people. And that is still there for anyone that did want to donate um, in any way. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, it is still there. But just keeping the conversation going about poor housing and the housing crisis up until past the next election, we need to make it a priority. Otherwise, more people are going to continue dying in their homes, essentially. And the cost of living crisis hasn't even really kicked in yet. Yeah. It's going to get so much worse. People are going to be evicted mm. and it's going to honestly go from bad to worse. And we need to keep this conversation going. But I want to I want to make sure I give a massive thank you to everyone on social media so far who's carried my work 
this far because without them, I wouldn't have it wouldn't have grown at the speed that it has, and it's genuinely down to them and their constant sharing. And they don't realize what a retweet does, but yeah. it's it's huge and it's massive and it gets answers for tenants ultimately. And yeah, yeah I'm forever grateful to them. But also, like I mentioned earlier, there are MPs that genuinely do want change. And I'm glad that there is a ray of light there too within politics that people do genuinely want to want to get this sorted and get this fixed. But we have to make sure we do it in the correct way and in an informed way um, and informed by tenants and that are living in poor housing and living in social housing and private housing that know what it's like to really suffer and know what it's like that to, to know what it's going to take to fix this crisis for them once and for all. You're amazing. Thank, Thank you. you so much for coming on. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, honestly, you're incredible. Thank you so I, much. For me uh, yeah, let me know if there's any way I can support yes. you. You're, yeah, I mean, I'll be supporting everything you do online, but yeah. honestly, you're yeah. just... No, oh, thank so you. Great. I'm. I'm just glad to be here and be able to sh share the message because I think these things need to be happening. At least I think there needs to be more talk on social issues, whether yeah. it's housing or the cost of living crisis. Just yeah. general day to day. I mean, social media has become this place where, oh, you have to live up to expectation and be on a beach or a yacht somewhere, yeah, yeah. looking absolutely amazing. But That's behind so closed doors, yeah, there's 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 so many people suffering. Yeah, and there's nothing wrong with being on a yacht and looking good and enjoying yourself. Absolutely, but. We need to be having these conversations about real day to day issues that are affecting millions of just everyday normal people. Yeah, you're so right. Mm. You're so right.